Hello Sheriff, welcome to Springville, Utah. Uh, we're kind of down here in the uh, black room and uh, the Crocker sits here as it has for over a decade. A decade? And, uh, close to the same state <laughs> it's always been. Tay Herrera did a wonderful job of engraving the tank. And um, so we've got a lot of original parts. And Latin, Jim Latin has uh, a Hemi head motor for me. It's a 1938 that I'll be popping in that soon. And then we got a few of the club cuts on the walls. The one I think that's most interesting is this one. This one down here is kind of fun. It's this club creepers. And um, these guys, I believe, were uh, they were motorcycle, but they were probably a black club. All right. And kind of a strange deal here. And then when we got into this one, I never could figure out the history on this one until somebody told me to watch this certain movie. And this is a fictional club. This was literally a uh, one of those kind of deals that was a prop uh -huh. made for Hollywood and in one of the many lousy movies made in the 70s, yeah. this was one of those clubs yeah. that uh, showed up. And, and, you, and you'd be surprised how many um, groupings of 20 or 30 club cuts just end up on eBay that were really film props and they were yeah. never really a club, you know. Uh, and, and I've kind of slowed down on buying any of these things anymore because there's a certain fellow on eBay that is making counterfeits. Mm -hmm. and, and they're good because he's buying original denim and he's finding old orphan patches and he's kind of sewing them together. So okay. in reality, they're, they're kind of real, but they're more of a decoupage than they are a vest that ever existed with any provenance. You know? But how about sinners? The sinners, well, we are, we're okay with those. These, the sinners are more of like the Girl Scouts than the uh, motorcycle club. Okay. <laughs> and on the floor, you just found some uh, extra collectors. Yeah, this is kind of neat. This one's special. You know, this was a, this was an old Steve McQueen, the kitty cat on there, and this was probably a woman's. Flossie was her name. Uh huh. And uh, there's uh, this one is quite extraordinary. Look at this one. This is Fritz. Indian motorcycle, uh, Reading, Pennsylvania. And so I how old are these? This is early. This is, if you look at this one, this is not, probably 1920s, if not wow. 19-teens. And um, it's got the Indian on the front. Yeah. And if you see the big cut right here out of it, I've got the guy's helmet, his gloves, and his underwear. <laughs> and his underwear, he yeah. wore full, uh, full length underwear, bottoms and tops. And he must have crashed and received some kind of a wound right here because they're stained right in this groin area. Okay. And, and so they, they literally must have just kind of cut the sweater off and, and turned it away. But it's funny to see that I have, and it might be laying here, the other garment. This is like cold case. Yeah. yeah I mean, there's his, there's his britches there. <laughs> <laughs> and then if you look at uh, his, his, oh, there we go, see? Yeah. Here is his undergarment, and there it too is cut away, see? So that kind of is a, is a symbol of, you know, probably this was removed from him as he laid there in agony, you know? Case closed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and then you get the different, you know, you get the different ones. These more of these like, um, uh, you know, uh, probably, I would guess, right when polyester was getting hot, mm. you know, and this nice stretchable, breathable stuff. And then you go back to like the gabardine, you know, which would have been clear 50s and, and very... Aren't you trace these style. on the eBay or where do you find them? Well, you know, you really find them everywhere. You find them at motorcycle swap meets, you find them at, uh, at, the, at the Deseret Industries, you find them at the, um, the Goodwills, the uh, th thrift clothing stores. And, and for the longest time, I could get them from other vintage clothing uh, collectors. And I'd find like a nice choice piece of like new old stock denim, which they just praised and gave all the value to. Yeah. And as soon as they saw a vest with the sleeves cut off and patches, it was really a bottom, bottom feeder piece, you know? Okay. And so for a while, I was kind of the guy that would go, hey, this guy buys this junk and, and he'll trade good stuff for it. And then all of a sudden, they, uh, they, they kind of caught on to, oh, well, this junk actually has some pretty nice folk art value to it. Yeah. And so those kind of days are over of me just, you know, really it was out there and it was, it was discarded. And it was not being appreciated by 
um, the collectors, it was not being appreciated by the motorcycle public in general, and it was not being appreciated by the clubs themselves. Oh. Now it's time to come around where these guys are reminiscing or they're kind of seeing that, that oh, I saw one of those go on eBay for a thousand bucks. Oh, geez, I gave mine away. And all of a sudden they want it back type of deal. So it's come full circle. Yep. And so it used to be fun to try to preserve a history that was being neglected to a point where now I'm in these political quagmires as to why I have this piece. Yep. And, and they don't like your explanation of I paid four dollars at the Goodwill for it. You know, and then they say, uh, you know, well, you're not a member of the club, you shouldn't have it. And uh -huh. I say, well, then you should get a hold of the club member that gave it to Goodwill and punish him accordingly. But I was just a guy that bought a scrap, you know. Uh, the lady behind me wanted to make a quilt out of it. Yeah. So be thankful I got it, you know. So when you're not collecting this, uh, where's... We would like to take a really sneak preview of what where you do your we'll, we'll go daily into, work. We'll maybe go into the sculpting room, but there's certain areas that'll be off limits. Okay, we will respect that, sir. <laughs> Does that work? Okay. Okay. In here, Back to the wild boar first. The wild boar, yeah. In my head in the vacuum. Okay. So right here. What we've got going on is, is this is, I've come up with what I can, and this is the, this is kind of, the, the sculpture is done. The sculpture is actually uh, been molded, and, and I'll take you into the other room, and it's literally, uh, the waxes are being poured, they'll start to go through slurry. So we probably, um, uh, four weeks from now, I'll have a completed sculpture that will be the version of this. And this is a Robert Williams painting, and him and I are collaborating. Oh. And uh, this is a, um, it's called the uh, Flight of the Last Dodo. So I went ahead and did some research and I found a photo. And what's quite comical is, this is from the Chicago Museum and the provenance is very good. It's 1946, January. And they state that from this, uh, this uh, skeleton, which of course, if this were a real dodo skeleton, it'd probably be mm -hmm. worth a million dollars. But they made these like early replicas for the museums, made mm -hmm. out of a, a Bakelite or resin or something like that. So I was fortunate enough to get an early replica of the dodo. But what I can't figure out is, is how from that they came up with this. I mean, literally the feet come out of the bottom of the body yeah. When here you have this, you know, structure where the, the leg is never to be hidden by what? You know, where's the joint? Where's, and then this little wing, and it's so great because they say in here, uh, uh, this is the most anatomically correct version that we think, uh, you know, the dodo must have looked like. Really? So you find a bunch of different versions. And so what's neat about it is, is, is Robert did his research based on these different things. Now they're starting to revamp what they think the dodo really looked like. But because no photos exist of the dodo, because the dodo was extinct by the 1500s, there are only like Dutch drawings mm -hmm. and different things. And you go from, from very adept uh, guys that could sketch to very crude type of deals. And they vary considerably. Yep. And, and, and we don't know if there were two or three species on that island and one of them was extinct or whatever it was. But some of them are these heavy, clumpy, ugly turkeys and others are more of like a vulture type creature but apparently they didn't have a, uh, a natural enemy on the island mm -hmm. so when man approached them with uh, you know a, 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 a little tidbit in his hand the bird would feed from your hand and then they'd club it and, and they went extinct quickly so th is this a special order for a customer or you make it just no, for yourself no, or? no this is really me uh, uh, bothering robert williams to the point where he, I broke him, and I said, you know, I wanna, I, you know, to, to me, when, when I look at the, when I look at the, the Godhead of custom culture, and I think of Ed Roth and Von Dutch and Robert Williams, mm -hmm. to you, me, Robert, the only living member of that that Southern California cult, uh, we're, 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 we're the most academic. You are the most talented. You're the most prolific, and and I liked your work the best, and I like this playful nature, and also. There's, if you realize, all my work, even though this seems like a real stretch from what you expect from a Jeff Dunner yeah. sculpture, remember, all my pieces have a man on a motorcycle, so it is a nice synergy between 
the mechanical and the organic. Well, that dodo is still organic and, yeah. and synergy because you've strapped this ridiculous contraption on this poor beast who can't fly. You have a biplane with a single engine prop, you know, gas motor, and, and it's the audacity of man saying, well, evolution hasn't allowed this thing to fly, but we'll fix that. You know, and it's kind of one of these, uh, these deals that, that, that Robert Williams' humor was just, it, it's in there. And, and, uh, and so when we discussed that, I was really surprised how receptive he was, and then I brought him the sculpture, and then I just saw him a couple of days ago, and, and uh, some doing some things with uh, Suzanne as well. But here's some of the little, like this, actually this cabinet was, uh, James Brucker Sr. was the one that uh, owned Cars of the Stars, and, mm -hmm. and Brucker's in Santa Paula had the largest collection of any of the counterculture stuff. And this was a piece that uh, James Sr., I think, had given to Steve McQueen to keep all his, you know, nicks and knacks in. But I just thought it was a fabulous Beautiful. piece of furniture as so we pulled it out of the airplane hangar, you know. But how is it, I have to ask you, if somebody already ordered a sculpture from you and somebody wants a copy of it, do you do that or you want I to do. make exclusive? No, 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 I, I try not to do, see, because, because, uh, Commissioned sculptures are, would be so extremely expensive. If I had to take six months of my life and time, yeah. then I had to take the time to create the exclusive mold for that specific piece. And then I were to cast it and they were to get it. Mm -hmm. If they were willing to pay the hundreds of thousands of dollars for that single sculpture, I would do them for yeah. them. But that price will scare them off. Yeah. So I do an addition of like 29 and literally the first four or five uh, our, our break-even proposition. It's yeah. not until I get into the higher numbers that, that I can start amortizing the cost of the mold and the six months lost at, at, at zero wage and those kind of things. And sometimes I sell, the, I sell the sculpture out at the unveiling yeah. and I make a home run and then there's other sculptures that I have an addition of 59 of and I've sold three. So you know what I mean? It's one of those things that I, I can't figure out what the public wants, you know. Cool. So. so this is the secret well, I in the house, or well, this is kind of it gets you know we're getting we're getting into the less filmable stuff. It gets okay. into the dirtier and dirtier area. But I give you fifteen the, seconds. Then. Here's the here's the dodo. You I know, am. there's his torso. There's his poor head. You know, been cut off. His amputated. Yeah. There's his ass end. And uh, you literally have got to cut him. There's his wings. You know, you've got the wings there. There's the gas tank that sit on top of the, uh, the, of, the of the wings up there. And you know, there's the there's the, the the torso for the monument that's at the Harley Davidson Museum, uh -huh. and and then just some other junk, you know. But uh, okay. let me take you into the room where we've made the molds, and uh, literally are pulling waxes. We should come back to these too. So another room that's just void of glamour but a dirty business. And so what we've got is, is what you saw was the original clay in there, yeah. and here is the mold. And the mold is, is a silicone rubber mold that you put four or five coats on until you feel that you've got it registered. Yeah. It captures the detail. The plaster holds the integrity to the piece. And then I bolt them together and I pour them, and then you gingerly pull that thing out. And then that is what you cut patches into and you send through the slurry. This will get a ceramic coating on it over about a week's period of time. Mm -hmm. And then we'll pour that in bronze and I'll have one of the puzzle pieces for the dodo bird to go back together. And uh, so basically you see that the, you know, it's, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, this is actually a fairly simple mold. There'll probably only be about 20 or 25 separate components, which one of my motorcycle pieces might be 60 or 70, you know. A lot of things to so, keep track of. Yeah, yeah, and then we try to, you know, we'll go ahead and we'll put dodo head, and then we'll number the mold, you yeah. know, this is one of 25 units, and, and try to keep it to where uh, it's understandable, you know. Yeah. So. Okay, but, the uh, last two bikes out here. Yeah, you want to talk about these or go upstairs? This is, the one that we got, this is the one that we got at the Bottoms auction just a couple months ago. And this was the one that was the Grand National Champion that uh, won every race in Australia by a San Franciscan rider. And the rider, after he won everything, took his loot, went home and bought himself a new bike, but the bike remained in Australia. And there's only two of these. Uh, Dale Waxler's got the other. 
And um, it's an extremely rare motorcycle. It's a CA, where the one upstairs is a CAC. The one upstairs is a proper speedway bike, where this is more considered maybe a, you know, a pea shooter, if you will. But uh -huh. if you look at the crazy lugs, and if you look at how the, how the frame has been cast to kick up because the, because the, the head is extra tall, there's all kinds of nuances that never appeared on any production motorcycle ever. What year are we talking? This bike is 1930. The uh, Bonhams auction uh, catalog uh, pronounces 1929, mm -hmm. and I have no idea why. It made no sense. The cases say 30 right on it. So. Mm -hmm. But uh, and then this bike is very interesting too. This bike, I actually this this bike's got flying ripple forks on it, and it was it was a you know this was a head that wasn't sold to the public. This is a four valve racing head with a homemade gas tank and oil bladder, uh, flying ripple forks, and the um, handlebars bent in a typical Malvin Jones fashion. See how they're asymmetrical because yeah. you, know, you do the one way on them. And then to find a bike, these both these bikes as is as race condition. You know they're in as race condition. You know to, to have them soaking in their own juices. Uh, there's no defiling of history that's taking place here. And 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 I'm done with them. You know people wonder, will I restore them? Will heaven know? No, 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 no. Where they are. And so I, as I'm going through the AMA archives, I find this old clipping in a newspaper that says, has anybody seen Kelly's? And here's the bike. And I look at it, and I start looking at it closer, and I read about it and everything else, and apparently it says that this bike set an all-time record in 1925, was done on a one-cylinder motorcycle. So this is, uh, uh, it says, um, Kelly was the first man in history to ride faster than a mile in a minute on a half-mile track. And I'm sure that's with a certain cubic inch and yeah. single cylinder and every little nuance that made it a record. And then the prosthetic leg on there just is uh, uh, really no excuse. Just That's some play we've, we've gone, yeah, yeah. We've gone over four. Yeah. That's hot dryers of uh, Indian flesh inside car. All right, Jeff. Yeah. Thank you much for your time and uh, good luck in the future, man. Thank